Look at this thing, 1939 Lagonda V12. I've returned to the Garage Car Museum in Salina, Kansas to check out the new exhibit. This current exhibit for fall of 2022 is called Chasing the Checkered Flag. And you can see we've got the full range of competition cars from NASCAR to drag racing, dirt racing. Right here we've got the Chevrolet Camaro ready to pounce on the drag strip. And right next to it we have its arch rival. This is a pretty rare car, a prototype Cobra Jet Mustang. They only built 50 of these total and so there were three original prototypes that they used for testing. This one was the only survivor, the other two were destroyed afterward. The Camaro you can see is a blend of stock factory original parts as well as many aftermarket modifications, obviously for straight line speed. 1200 horsepower car, supercharged. I mean, this thing, by all practical considerations, it's an animal. This is a neat one. This is a 30 year old NASCAR. Ernie Irvin's Chevrolet Lumina. See, obviously, tube chassis V8 with a car skin over it. Actual real stock car Lumina would have been front wheel drive. This shows the evolution of NASCAR at this time. Kind of neat they got the looping footage of parts of the race there. This car has been restored to the way it looked at the time of the race. Up on the turntable is this 1950s. Indianapolis 500 car. This is typical of the 1950s look. Starting to see the cigar shape. It is open wheel. Still a pretty tall skinny tire with a tread pattern on it. The Indy 500 track is of course uh, asphalt oval. Other details of this one are the knockoff magnesium wheels. See the exposed steering shaft there on the side. Chrome roll bar. By the 1950s the average speeds of the Indy 500 were around 130-140 miles per hour. 30 years later you can see the changing shape of the Indy cars. They became more square and boxy as everything else in the 80s. You can see the tires have about doubled in width. They've become a lower profile, closer to the track, just like the rest of the car, with a slick, smooth tread. However, other features like the low roll bar and the low windshield, still pretty much there, the same as they were in the 50s. You can see they also added the front and rear wings. In the mid-1980s, the Indy cars hit 200 miles per hour for the first time. And so aerodynamics and downforces and those sorts of things started to take on quite a bit more significance than they had earlier on. This Toyota-powered car is actually in the International Motorsports Association, so a little smaller than an Indy car, probably a little lower speed. This one is now raced in a division of the SCCA called the Formula Atlantic. This one's actually owned by the museum, so probably figure it was something that was donated. I don't know any of the details as far as competition on it, but it'd be something to be curious to find out. Just like I'm curious what that Toyota engine looks like under the cover there. So each Indy 500 race has a pace car. 
And the purpose of the pace car is since these races have what's called a rolling start rather than Formula One, which is a standing start, the pace car basically takes them through the warm-up laps and then when it's time for the race to start, then it pulls off the track. This is a 1974 Oldsmobile Cutlass and for any manufacturer to have their car chosen for the pace car is a pretty special honor. This one you can see has all the sport touches. These swivel bucket seats were a specific option to these colonnade roof cars which were 1973 through 77 GM A body intermediates. This one of course is a pace car replica so it has all the stripes and special paint, two colored vinyl top. It was quite an honor for manufacturer to pace the race and so obviously a lot of free marketing out there on the track and they wanted to show that to their customers and buyers. Let's see everything this one was equipped with. Just pretty neat vehicle overall. Two-tone vinyl top. This one was sold new just down the road in McPherson, Kansas. And not quite sure if this is totally original car or unrestored. But either way, they have preserved it in very pristine, immaculate condition. Another tradition of the ND500 is that the driver of the pace car is usually some sort of automotive celebrity. And so for 1974, that driver was Jim Rathman. And he had been the winner of the 1960 Indy 500. This little certificate here just shows that 1994, this car was taken out on the Indy 500 track as part of a show reunion. So there you can see, captured a picture of it there. This car overall just super super neat piece of our country's transportation history and something that tells the story of these racing events this one's a 1948 jeep that's been modified for off-road racing so you can see the bigger tires and they've removed the windshield put a roll bar in tilt column out of a 70s gm car These Jeeps are an obvious derivative of the World War II models. Once they had proven their utility out on the battlefield, they sold an awful, awful lot of them in the civilian market in varying configurations. Here is a 49 Studebaker. This one's really neat story. It was basically bought out of a junkyard and someone did tremendous amount of work to it to bring it where you see here and this one's actually been out raced on the salt and you can see it's even picked up a few trophies in the process just really quite a transformation See the actual chunks of Bonneville salt in the case there. Great transformation from rusted junkyard hulk to something that's proven competition vehicle. There are many different classes of racing out at the flats. So have things from Older cars to later model stuff like this Corvette. 
They actually didn't get to race out there this year. It was flooded. Think of it as a dry lake bed, but it is a lake bed. It's kind of an interesting one. Front wheel drive Pontiac Grand Am, which has obviously been converted to rear wheel drive. Tube chassis. Big block Chevy engine in there. Salt flats themselves have a lot of history. Back to the early days of hot rodding. Salt flats are in northwest Utah, right on the Nevada border there. They race cars, motorcycles, not against each other, but really against themselves, just to prove top speed. And a lot of people don't know this, but they also do competition archery for distance out on the flats. This is a really unique car. This is the 56 Thunderbird, which was actually Rod and Customs project car for several years there in the late 50s. And of course it was raced out on the salt. You can see there's a lot of documentation for this car obviously since it was done in the magazine just a very very important piece of our country's transportation history and hot rod history in general this car has actually been in kansas for a while it was sold a couple of years ago out of an estate Guy had just a collection of old Fords in a small town in Kansas. He had been in the restaurant business and amassed a good bit of money out of that. And he just didn't have a lot of family. Wasn't really even that active in the car community. But he had a really good eye for the cars that he liked. And those are what he collected. And so it's made its way up to Salina in a couple of years since that estate was liquidated. I love this photo because it captures the excitement of what that event must have been like. Everybody had a purpose and a job to do when they were there and made it all come together. So here's kind of a neat one. This is a Ford two-door wagon, 1957. Little bit of a competitor to the Nomad, but not its own separate body shell like the Nomads were. Guy bought this car in 71 and fitted it with the supercharger on the Y block and drag raced this thing for quite a lot of years. You see the different looks and configurations that it had there just super neat piece of history a lot of these old tracks are going away and there's various reasons for that some of its real estate some of its just waning interest but really neat to see an old car like this that is a relic of that period of our drag racing history see he's got the i think 68 or 9 torino or mustang seats in there got the craggers on it super sharp car over here we've got a 64 hemi belvedere see this one pretty attractive colors white and red this was the first year that the Hemi was available for the muscle cars. 
and it was available in the catalog till 71. One particular item of note is the license plate. You can see that the sequence number also matches the date, which is highly coveted among license plate collectors, and they do sell for a premium. These 1962 through 65 Dodge and Plymouth B body cars, especially the two door posts, are very desirable for drag racing cars. They were just strong, lightweight, really sturdy cars, and there's a lot of racing history that they have. Two-door post is pretty difficult to find today, just given how they were used, and not a lot of them around every corner. Two obvious visual differences on the front of this car are the hood scoop as well as the elimination of the inboard headlights. You can see they trimmed a piece of an extra grill for each one of those to continue it in the hole where the bulb used to go. If one Chrysler Hemi is good, two must be better. This is a 60s era dragster. You can see the magnesium spindle mount front wheels. The length of these helps give them stability on the track. Both the engines are supercharged. Engineering project like this to not only get them to work, but work together and put that power down and do something with it is really quite an amazing feat. I'm more of a body guy, collector, not really that much of a mechanical guy, definitely not an engineer, but to see what they've done here and how they've actually made this into a fearsome competitive performer is really just pretty unique marvel to stand here and look at. I can only imagine what it would be like to be in the presence of this thing in motion. Youngsters could get their first taste of speed powered by gravity in these soapbox derby cars. Kids built them themselves and then raced them. You can see the later models were more aerodynamic. And the early model here almost has a 1920s Indy car vibe to it. And this is one of four surviving from the 1935 race, which is the second running of the Soapbox Derby. See super neat details on this one. It's got fabric covered body, probably a wood frame underneath, and these others would have been either wood or metal. The Soapbox Derby is still being held annually. It's a good way for these kids to learn how to construct a car, and learn competition. They learn how to plan a project, how to cut, how to measure, which fasteners to use, as well as physics. These gravity-powered cars reach around 30 miles an hour going down the downhill track. Here's another dirt track car. These run in the modified class. So originally these were 1967 through 72 GM A body cars, which is what the chassis is. And as the years went on, they kind of ended up using less of the body and still the original GM frames. Now the bodies are basically a roll cage covered in sheet aluminum. Over here, we've got the Doc Hudson from the Cars movie, which obviously was cartoon, but based on real cars, and so people have taken the models and constructed real-life versions of them. 
this is a really excellent excellent restoration of 51 Hudson then we've got the Lightning McQueen this one's built on a Mazda Miata kind of tough to tell exactly what that one would have been originally but with the little front marker lights in the bumper the Miata really captures the right look I've been told you can buy the little window shades there on Amazon. So if anybody wants to give their car a Disney Cars look, that's an easy way to do it without the paint. This 1957 Ford Fairlane 500 has competed in the Great Race, which is a timed road course. There's a driver and a co-pilot, and the race is heavy on navigation and meeting checkpoints and times. This one's owned by McPherson College, which is where I went to school, and I do remember seeing it there in the restoration lab when I was there. Pretty neat little tag topper. I believe they actually sand cast those out of aluminum there at the school to teach the kids that skill. First in college is a four-year degree for auto restoration, and it covers metalwork, mechanical, upholstery. My true love was sheet metal. Panel fabrication, welding, rust repair. I have great memories of my time at the school. Right here are the dirt track midget cars. There are different size classes of these. I think quarter midget, half midget, something like that. They race these on circle track. And so they were kind of based on early V8 Ford parts. You can see this one here runs a V860, which was the 60 horse kind of small block version of the flathead. Regular flathead was an 85 horse. Some of these borrow early flathead era front suspension, straight axles, wishbones, things like that. And then as time went on, they got into more aftermarket parts and little more complicated builds as the super modified shows these cars are still raced today and pretty much all of them that you see have the big wings on the roof here's the 1985 ducati 750 this is a road racing motorcycle kind of a high-end piece a little bit along the lines of Lamborghini or Ferrari, just on two wheels. Kind of neat with the red, white, and green paint scheme. They definitely wanted people to know that this thing was Italian out on the track. And over here, there's a few more motorcycles. These ones are primarily for dirt racing motocross that sort of thing zundap 125 really neat manufacturing history on those then 72 harley davidson a lot of people think of harleys just as street bikes but they did build a few for the dirt as well got the jawa and then this kawasaki really neat story on it this is a young girl who's just getting started in racing, and it's a brand new bike, and she's got her whole life, her whole career ahead of her, and just kind of neat to see where that thing will go and where it'll take her. Next to it is the 73 Husqvarna. Fascinating company, Swedish. They've been in business for over three centuries, 333 years, and they've made all kinds of products, sewing machines, power equipment, 
firearms, you name it. Fascinating history to read about. Last in the lineup is the 2023 Kawasaki. Brand new bike. Makes an interesting comparison juxtaposed against the early bikes. You can see how far they've come. Here's another Hudson Hornet, which is a replica of Tim Flock's NASCAR car. You can see back in the early days of NASCAR, it still was truly a stock car. They would buy them out of the dealerships and prep them a little, not much, just mainly paint and take them out on the track and run them. By about the 70s was getting to be the end of the actual stock bodies. And then in the 80s they were pretty much just a replica shell with a tube chassis underneath. This one, super, super neat car. This is a Grand Prix Aero Coupe. It is a G-body with a very special rear hatch on it. And additionally, they had this arrow nose, and these were basically designed to be something that would be in regular production, just pretty much to excuse being able to build NASCAR cars with better aerodynamics. This one's in immaculate condition, very, very original car, preserved, pristine, factory lacquer paint, still with the showroom gloss. This is just the way you like to find them, just the way you like to see them. These cars have really taken off in collector value, and to be able to find a good example is going to bring a premium price. There are other forms of stock car racing, not just NASCAR. And so this Camaro here is a good example of that. And this one is owned by the Midwest Dream Car Collection. That's another car museum which is just down the road in Manhattan, Kansas. So if you're in the area, definitely check them out. Look at this thing, 1939 Lagonda V12. Manufacturing history of the company is as exciting as the car itself. Lagonda was a British company that was actually started by an American engineer who began his career as an opera singer. He started out with motorcycles, and then the first Lagonda automobile was built in 1907. During World War I, the company manufactured artillery shells. And then throughout the 20s and 30s, they really started to develop their racing pedigree. Then in 1947, the company became merged as part of Aston Martin. The little Datsun Roadster and the Triumph Spitfire are fitted out for Sports Car Club of America racing. These are short, tight little tracks with turns, and so the emphasis really is on handling and just overall driving skill in general. They're prepped out with roll bars, obviously. They take the windshields off because the drivers are wearing helmets, of course. To really be successful in SCCA racing, you need a car that's nimble, with a pretty short wheelbase, but still has peppy horsepower to be able to accelerate down the straights. This one here, I don't know why, but this is one that I think is a really, really neat car. little Volkswagen sand rail with a fiberglass body over it. Best part about this one for me is just that it's such a total time capsule. Untouched, I mean, literally everything about it down to the tires is all authentic, period correct, hasn't been updated or monkeyed with at all. It's just exactly how they built it back in the day, and it's been 
preserved untouched since then. If you're in the area and happen to be coming through Salina, definitely come check out the museum. This display will be here through the fall. And then the next after this will be emergency vehicles. So if you like racing and competition cars, this is definitely the exhibit to come and see. If you haven't been here before, there's a whole other wing of the museum that's custom and hot rod cars. And if you have been here before, come on back because a lot of these have been rotated in with new ones.